Live from Pier 3 in San Francisco, welcome to Bloomberg West, where we cover the global technology and media companies that are reshaping our world. I'm Emily Chang. Our focus is on innovation, technology, and the future of business. Let's get straight to the rundown. Yahoo says there will be no severance pay for ousted CEO Scott Thompson. This after announcing Ross Levinson is taking over as interim CEO. And activist shareholder Dan Loeb is getting his hard-fought seat on the board. Groupon says its revenue is up nearly 90% over the last year as the Daily Deal site tries to regain investor trust after accounting errors forced the company to revise its last set of quarterly numbers. And Mark Zuckerberg celebrates his 28th birthday as the company he founded prepares to go public. Bloomberg has learned demand is so high, Facebook plans to stop taking orders two days ahead of schedule. But first, to the lead. Scott Thompson is out, Ross Levinson is in, and Dan Loeb has won. Thompson has resigned as CEO of Yahoo amidst accusations. He added a fake computer science degree to his resume. But he didn't take responsibility for the error or even explain it. However, Thompson did tell the board he's been diagnosed with thyroid cancer, part of the reason given for stepping down. Loeb, the activist investor who exposed Thompson's resume flaw, will be joining Yahoo's board along with two of his nominees, Harry Wilson and Michael Wolf. Yahoo's head of global media, Ross Levinson, has been named interim CEO. He will be the fifth CEO at Yahoo in just Five years. Now, Yahoo stock closed just above 2% today amid the shakeup, but it's lost more than half that since late 2005. Levinson inherits a company struggling to stay relevant, and there are some pressing issues he will have to address right away. For more on that, let's bring in our editor at large, Corey Johnson, in the newsroom. And Corey, what's interesting is the layoffs that Scott Thompson initiated are still going on even today. Uh, the, the level of demoralized uh, workers at Yahoo is probably hard to imagine. You know, you brought up the five CEOs. But don't forget Tim Morris, also his CFO, is an interim CFO in there. You could argue that six people have been CEO in a five-year stretch, uh, two of them being interims. Uh, not good news either way. But if you look at the stock chart, you start to see some optimism. At least you can see what investors uh, start to imagine with this company, that maybe there's a chance uh, that something, uh, something kind of value. You can see what happened to the stock back in August when the sort of activist uh, notion for investors started to pick up. And, and as we've been talking about lawsuits against Facebook over patents, about resume gate, about fighting for seats on the board, it's entirely possible the new focus will be the old focus, and that is the true value of the company underneath Yahoo. Take a look at, it, at this pie chart that shows you a series of assets that Yahoo, we haven't talked about this in months, but don't forget the Alibaba assets been valued at five and a half billion dollars. Yahoo Japan, a non-core asset, valued at 2.6 billion dollars. The company still has 2.2 billion dollars in cash and is still creating free cash flow. That means that this company, the 19 billion dollar market cap, is only being valued at about 8.6 billion dollars. That's only about eight times uh, uh, operating profits or EBITDA. So a company valued at eight times profits, that's a pretty reasonable play if the whole thing doesn't fall apart, if they can liberate those other assets. And you've got to think that uh, that's going to be a goal getting here soon. And, Corey, what to do with these Asian assets might well be first thing on Ross Levinson's list. Is there any sense that the new focus, his focus, will finally yield a sale of those assets? I think he's not going to get to have a focus. I think the big change here is you've got three board members, rep members representing the interests of Wall Street. And so whatever's on Ross Levinson's agenda is going to be second to the board's agenda, a newly energized board with Dan Loeb really taking a charge. Dan Loeb was really carefully studied this business. was a lot more on the line than just about anyone there, with the exception of Jerry Yang, of course, who's gone, and David Filo has been gone from the board for a long time. So he's got the largest outside shareholder. Now he's going to be on the board, and he's going to be demanding demanding changes whether Ross Levinson is ready to bring him or not. So while Ross Levinson might be focusing on what's going on inside Yahoo, Dan, Levin, Dan Loeb and, and the board are going to be making him focus on creating value to the shareholders of Yahoo. Those will be interesting dynamics indeed. Thanks so much, Corey. Meantime, the changes at Yahoo have left some wondering if its future will be much more media focused. Our senior West Coast correspondent John Ehrlichman is here with that part of the Yahoo story. And Ross Levinson very well respected in 
media circles. Yeah. I, I mean, a guy who spent time at HBO, at CBS, at Fox. And if you look at the changes to the board over the last few months, you've got people from, with experience from IAC and Discovery. Michael Wolf just joined the board. He worked at MTV running the shop there. What I've heard over the last 24 hours are a lot of people saying because this company generates virtually all its money from advertising, that they are a traditional media company. And yet, there are so many differences between a company like Yahoo and CBS. I mean, CBS is a pretty simple story. It's content, it's on the channel, and then they'll sell some of that content to others like Netflix. In the case of Yahoo, this is a company that has created itself based on the technology that delivers their content. Um, think about some of their biggest properties. They might not be growing in the ways they once did, but Yahoo Mail, Yahoo Messenger, Yahoo Answers, Yahoo Finance, even uh, the fantasy sports product that they have. All of these have been delivered in an effective way and helped Yahoo get to 700 million users, in large part because of the technology behind it. And you hear this within, uh, inside Yahoo, those people who say, hold on a second, we can't be a traditional media company. We've got all this existing technology. Let's play up the fact that we've got it and build off of that. And, and, and really the question for any sort of content creator right now is how are people going to consume content in the future, which is really a technology question. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the reasons why we're seeing technology companies hold up fronts the way media companies do. Yahoo's no exception on that front. Two things I'd say about this. First of all, since the days of Terry Semmel, who used to run Yahoo, they've had a generally good relationship with Hollywood. But because Hollywood's on board with what you want to do and they're willing to license you whatever they've got, that doesn't necessarily make the best product. I think some people might point to Yahoo Music for that. But the other thing is, okay, so they're going to make a bigger push in content. Great. How are they going to distribute it? Is the best place to distribute it via Facebook or Twitter? We know Yahoo's social media presence doesn't really exist. And then does that tell you that the effective platforms are those owned by those social networking players? And where does ultimately Yahoo lie in that debate. Ross Levinson's got a lot of tough questions no to consider. John Ehrlichman, thanks so much. So what do all these changes mean for Yahoo's future and the value for investors? For more on that, I want to bring in Brian Weezer of Pivotal Group Research, who covers Yahoo and currently has a buy on the stock. He joins me now from Portland, Oregon. Brian, so much drama just in the last 24 yeah. hours at Yahoo. Let's start with the Thompson question. He is out, no severance to speak of. Is this the right call? Well, it clearly was becoming too much of a distraction. Uh, one thing we found is that the demoralization was going to start to impact the company potentially. A exactly. I mean, in, in terms of a morality, from the standpoint of the morality issue, layoffs are still happening, layoffs that he instigated. How important is it for employees to have some kind of leadership change at the top? Well, the issue was that uh, credibility was starting to be sapped. I think that there was some risk inside of the company that maybe there might be risk of product delivery, that maybe the ad sales might lose focus. And if that were to happen, that would have become a, a bigger problem, I think, towards the end of the year. So, Ross Levinson, he's the guy replacing him in the short term. What do you think of him? And could he work out in the long term? Well, he, he certainly is well regarded by many in the industry. Um, I think the, the bigger issue is the process the board has to go through now to identify the permanent CEO. Uh, that's going to be uh, uh, as much of, a, of an issue. And whether or not Levinson is himself a candidate or not, I think, remains to be seen. Um, you're as powerful as the people below you let you be. And uh, he certainly has to make sure that engineering and product and all the other people are uh, su supportive of him as uh, many on Madison Avenue will be. And however long he is interim CEO, he is a media guy. The board is more media heavy now. What direction do you see them taking this company in? And is it in a media versus technology direction? Well, it would seem the media angle is probably the most important, if only because that's where the revenue lies. And I think to ignore that would be a, a, a big mistake. Um, that said, they do have some great technology assets. But where I think the board will be most focused is capitalizing on the value of the Asian assets. Um, our numbers are slightly different than those cited earlier, but we'd estimate almost three quarters of the value of the company lies in those Asian assets. And how they get out of that uh, situation uh, is really the most important issue. Secondarily, they have to figure out how to grow what is a secularly declining business in traditional display advertising on the web. Let's talk a little bit about the board. Fred Amoroso 
named Chairman Dan Loeb now on the board. These are going to be some really unique dynamics here. Do you think Dan Loeb is going to be calling the shots? Well, they'll have a lot of influence, I think it's safe to say. The good news for Yahoo and for shareholders in general is that this is a, a group of uh, investors that actually wants to see the company uh, thrive and do well. This is not your classic barbarians at the gate, uh, take the company and break it up. And it's, it's a very different situation. Uh, my understanding is certainly they see a lot of growth potential. Now, I don't necessarily see that same growth potential in the domestic business, but they do. And that's the right attitude. What has been the view from advertisers through all of this? Has Yahoo lost support from advertisers? There are lots of other attraction, attractive options out there. Yeah, this is something that really surprised us. Last week, as this uh, controversy was starting to flare, we, we decided to poll a number of marketers and advertisers uh, to find out, well, what do they think? Frankly, we were shocked by how little they cared. And that's a bigger problem when you think about Yahoo. Yeah, the fact that this used to be the most important medium, a complete contrast to network television, you know, the upfronts are going on right now, and although advertisers will complain to the ends of the earth about pricing, there's a reason they're complaining. They need it. They don't need Yahoo right now. So what about some of the things that are on the top of the list right now? For example, the Facebook Yahoo patent lawsuit. Scott Thompson was reportedly a big proponent of this suit. Do you see that? being settled now that he's gone. Well, this will be interesting, won't it be? Uh, certainly, Michael Wolf is known as uh, an advisor to Mark Zuckerberg as well as uh, now he's on the board of Yahoo. Um, that said, uh, certainly monetizing their patent portfolio is something that you would think they would want to do. But on the other hand, uh, in the balance of interests of, of the engineers and other employees who maybe see this sort of uh, um, effort as anathema to the culture of a Silicon Valley company, Maybe they back off of it, or maybe they just come to an agreement on, on sooner terms. Well, it certainly did get a strong negative reaction from a lot of people in Silicon Valley, so we'll be yeah. watching that one. Brian Weezer of Pivotal Research Group, thanks so much for joining us today from Portland. Thanks a lot. Coming up, Groupon had one of the worst public market debuts for a web company since the dot com crash, but will promising first quarter results rebuild investor confidence? That story is next. And you can get the latest tech headlines on our online tech channel, Bloomberg.com slash technology. Welcome back. I'm Emily Chang. Groupon reported earnings after the bell. Sales at the Daily Deal site up 14% from the previous quarter. The net loss was Nearly $5 million, but 95% better than the previous quarter. Groupon shares have been skyrocketing and after hours up more than 17%. Right now, Groupon CEO Andrew Mason had this to say on the conference call just moments ago. We believe that local commerce will uh, evolve into becoming one of the essential and fundamental use cases of, of mobile. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's enabled by the ability to have a computing device, an internet connection with you at all times. We think that mobile is an equal enabler to local commerce as, for example, uh, broadband is for online video. Now for a drill down on this stock on the move, let's get back to Corey in the newsroom. Corey? Yeah, Emily, I mean, uh, you told the story, the reaction this stock has had since it became a stock, not just a private company. When you look at the stock chart from the day these guys went public, well, you see it looks, uh, as I said to you in the office the other day, like a gentle ski slope, just sliding down. But all of a sudden, we got a mogul today with a stock up 20%. If you look at what's happened with that stock over that time period. Now, uh, among the things we can look at, is the operating profit for this company. And yes, I said profit. There was an operating profit from this company. Now, that's an operating profit before a bunch of other costs, before uh, other things were taken out. But an operating profit is better than an operating loss. And we see where these guys have come. Of course, there's got to be hope uh, from their part that things will start to get better. But uh, there's a lot more uh, questions about what's going on with this company and the metrics as well as we start to dig through them, Emily. Let's take a look at some of those important metrics, Corey. Yeah. Walk us through. How many new subscribers, for example, does Groupon have? Uh, that's a great question. They used to tell us how many subscribers they have, and then they've mysteriously just stopped giving out that number. So we don't know how many subscribers they have. Okay. What about featured merchants? Featured merchants, very important number. They included that in all the rest one filings before they went public. 
they stopped telling us that, so we don't know how many freezer merchants there are. It's a mystery. Is this typical, Corey, where they'll give some information and then give less information the next time around? It's very atypical. When companies break out metrics like that, Wall Street usually demands that they keep bringing them out. When companies stop giving metrics, it's, companies will often say it didn't matter, but usually if the metrics look good, they keep bringing them. So what about new customers? Tell me they, they told us how many new customers they have. They did. They told us how many new customers they had. The customers added. If you look at the customers added, uh, they added 3.9 uh, million new customers in the quarter. And that's important, of course, because the marketing spending from this company was so dramatic. But what we started to see, though, uh, with the new customer ad is the percentage of new customers added uh, was a little bit better than it's been in some quarters, but one of the worst they've ever reported. So, net net, Corey, do you think investors are going to, to be more confident in Groupon after these results, or it's going to take a much longer period of time before that kind of you know, confidence a, returns, if ever? Yeah, well, from an investing standpoint, there's a big short interest in this company. And what we saw with the short interest is perhaps a lot of people covering the stock, even today before the numbers came out, with fear of what was going on there. But maybe to look more at the earnings results, let's, we've got a guest, Aaron Kessler, is joining us, senior research analyst at Raymond James. Uh, you've covered this company, you've covered internet companies for a long time. Um, a pretty important quarter for these guys. And it, again, they lost money, a lot of money, 12 million bucks, but they had an operating profit, just kind of pretend to profit, that's not nothing. Yeah, no, I think that's key. I mean, the operating income margin was down about 30% last year, negative margin. This quarter is about a 12% positive margin. And the key factor is there, if you actually look at the marketing spend, they actually cut that in half year over year while growing revenue is about 90%. So clearly, they're starting to get some more engagement from customers and driving some marketing efficiency. And that's really key for the story longer term. Uh, with, without getting into valuation, because it's a whole different trip, uh, just the direction of this business, is, does this start to look like a self-sustaining business with this quarter? There's definitely aspects to that, at least in the North America business. North America was up 30% sequentially on basically lower marketing spend. International is relatively flat, but they put more targeting technologies into North America that they don't have international yet. So if they can continue to the smart targeting technology they've rolled out, more personalization, then it's a more interesting business longer term. Uh, but can you see that result? I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I'm skeptical by nature, as you know. Yeah. I'm skeptical of, of any company that talks about doing things before they've done it. Even the, the non-gap breakdown of U.S. versus North America. Right. I mean, if, if you look at the, the quarter they just reported, they say both businesses were profitable, uh, but there was no profit. Yeah, so I think on a non-GAAP basis, and I think the trend that we're seeing, I think you can extrapolate out where both businesses will be profitable. International is trailing domestic by a few quarters, so I think it's really what matters is the trend that we're seeing going forward, not necessarily the actual quarter numbers. Now, what do you make of the slowdown we've seen in, the, they've added a lot of new customers, uh, growth in new customers, although a much slower growth than we've seen in the past. Do you sort of pencil that out straight line? Yeah, it's going to continue to slow, but they'll continue to add customers? Yeah, so we generally expect new customer additions to slow over time, but what we're looking for, which is key in the quarter, is customer engagement seem to have increased, at least in the North America segment. So that's important going forward is that customers keep on coming back to the site and not just purchase once and then don't purchase again. Now, I took them to task about, uh, a little bit, about, ta about getting rid of those merchant numbers, getting rid of those uh, subscriber numbers. And the subscriber number was mm -hmm. a little bit pillory because they've sort of admitted in the filings a subscriber is just someone whose email address we right. think we have, even if it doesn't work and the email gets bounced back. But they stopped giving these merchant numbers, and these were numbers people use to build right. their models to understand the business. What does that tell you when a company does that? Yeah, it's usually not a good thing. I would say the CFO had, did come from Amazon, and Amazon has a very similar philosophy, so probably not a big surprise in that respect. Philosophy of taking away numbers that they used to say were important. Right, and yeah, exactly. And so, not a big surprise. So it's usually not good, and Amazon does something usually not good also. Well, no, I'm saying it, uh, very similar to Amazon, how they approach them, not giving a lot of numbers out. Some of them could be competitive for competitive reasons. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily think, lead that's going to be a negative reason going forward. Um, we want to obviously look at the overall numbers. But to the extent right. that they take away numbers, never a good thing, in my view. All right. Uh, Aaron Kessler, uh, Raymond James, glad to see you. Great. Thank you. Emily? Thanks, Corey. We'll be right back with more of Bloomberg West. Welcome back to Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. Bloomberg has learned Apple is preparing a new lineup of MacBook laptops featuring a more powerful Intel chip and high definition display. Apple is expected to unveil the new MacBook Pros at its annual developers conference in June. Our Bloomberg News reporter Adam Citariano helped break this story and is here with all the details. So Adam, what do we know?
Know that uh, if you're looking to go out and buy a new MacBook Pro, you might want to wait a little bit longer. Uh, Apple's going to be uh, showing off some new details of this uh, new MacBook Pro laptop. It's going to have the sharper, high-def screen that you see on the iPad and uh, iPhone now, and uh, it's going to work with the. It's going to have a flash memory drive, which basically means it'll start up faster and. Uh, and so it's going to have all these uh, new features. And it's going to be even thinner, right? Right now it's yeah, yeah. just under an inch thick. Right. The last time they uh, overhauled this lineup of the laptops was 2008, and it has a sort of unibody aluminum design, and, and they've had that for, you know, four years almost now, and so now this will be a slimmed down version. Uh, they have that MacBook Air laptop line uh, that's quite thin and slopes down. This one's going to be uh, quite thin as well. Right here, I got it on the set in front of me. Um, we also are, are going to be hearing about some other things, right? About Lion and new mobile software, right. iCloud. Right. Uh, you know, this is the annual uh, mecca for uh, Apple developers to come in and, and learn about some new details for their operating systems. And so the the uh, the PC operating system is the, the Mac OS, and so the newest one's going to be called Mountain Lion. And it's going to have some new features uh, for messaging between uh, your iPhone, iPad, and the Mac. Basically, what they're trying to do is integrate uh, all the devices more seamlessly so it doesn't matter which device you're on, you'll be able to perform some of the same tasks. And that leads me to the point, Macs now make up just 13% of Apple sales, right? So how important is this, really? Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because this is, was their main sales driver for so long, but ever since the iPhone, or really the iPod came on the scene, and then the iPhone and iPad, it's uh, become less of a high profile. But it's still, uh, they've, it's been gaining share, outperforming the market, and, and competitors like HP and Dell and Samsung, you see them taking on similar designs and incorporating similar elements. And of course, you will be all over this conference, June 11th, uh, the annual Apple Developers Conference, where we'll be looking out for all of these announcements. Adam Satariano, thanks so much. Thanks. And speaking of Intel, these new laptops will have Intel chips. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for a special hour of Bloomberg West Intel from the inside. We will be broadcasting live from the Intel Museum with an exclusive inside look at how the chip giant puts the Intel inside your gadgets. We'll have exclusive live interviews with Intel CEO Paul Odellini, COO Brian Grzanich, and head of mobile Mike Bell. That's tomorrow at our regular time, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. We'll have more of Bloomberg West next. You are watching Bloomberg West, where we focus on technology and the future of business. I'm Emily Chang with your Bloomberg Top Headlines. Light Squared filed for bankruptcy in New York today. The filing comes after negotiations with the wireless company's creditors broke down. The creditors wanted Phil Falcone, whose hedge fund owns a majority of the company, to step aside. But he'll remain with the company. LightSquare's efforts to build a new wireless network stalled after the FCC said the network could interfere with GPS signals. Shares of German TV maker Lowe surged to a 10-month high today on rumors that Apple might buy it. Apple Insider reported that Apple was ready to pay $112 million for the company with a final decision coming later this week. Lowe shot down the report saying there's no truth to the story. Apple had no comment. The four major broadcast networks are holding their upfront presentations to advertisers this week. It's the annual event where the networks unveil primetime plans for the next season while whining and dining potential advertisers. The upfront haul is expected to be $9 billion this season. Upfronts aren't restricted to the big networks anymore either. Digital channels like Hulu and YouTube held successful upfronts last week. And Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak is a big fan of Facebook and its founder, Mark Zuckerberg. Wozniak told Bloomberg Television in Australia the stock is a definite buy. I would invest in Facebook. You know, and I don't care what the, what the opening price is, is, I would just for, you know, good reasons, especially if I was an investor looking to make money. Wozniak also talked about the similarities he sees between Zuckerberg and his business partner, the late Steve Jobs. 
I was thankful to have a partnership with Steve Jobs. And I see Mark Zuckerberg closer to the combination of us. You know, I, when he speaks, he speaks with a lot of idealism for the users and a lot of good ideas for the product overall. Wozniak is currently chief scientist at Fusion IO, a flash memory technology maker whose biggest customer is Facebook. Meantime, Facebook's fast approaching IPO has left Mark Zuckerberg outside his comfort zone. The Facebook founder and CEO has been playing the role of salesmen, pitching potential investors from coast to coast. Our senior West Coast correspondent, John Ehrlichman, has more on how Zuck's been handling the road to the IPO. John? Emily, there's no doubt Mark Zuckerberg is well aware of the importance of this IPO, but in Zuck's world, there are plenty of important milestones, including, for example, clearing a billion users. Back up, guys. Back up. From media mobs in New York to SUV caravans in the Valley, welcome to Facebook's IPO Roadshow, starring Mark Zuckerberg. Even from very early on when we were just building this thing for, for one school, there was this concept of what it could turn into. We just weren't sure then that we would be the ones who did it. Well, he did it all right, but on the road show, Zuck's taken heat for everything from slowing ad growth to his signature hoodie. I think that's a mark of uh, immaturity. So does any of it phase Facebook's founder? A source close to Zuckerberg tells us he remains steady, focused, level-headed, traits he himself addressed in a November interview with Charlie Rose. I really try to live the mission of the company and embody that for the company and keep everything else in my life extremely simple. So, yeah, Analyst really Susan Ettlinger I, describes Zuck's approach as the go away, we're working on it attitude. In the past, what's really happened is that Facebook has focused in on what it's doing without really a lot of interference from the outside. You know, this could change with the IPO. But Zuckerberg's appreciation of how Steve Jobs ran Apple gives clues on how he'll run Facebook post IPO. I think we connected a lot on this level of, okay, Facebook has this mission that's really more than just trying to build a company, right, that has like a, a market cap or a value. It's like we're, we're trying to do this thing in the world. Meanwhile, Facebook's world is quickly moving from the desktop to the phone. While Zuckerberg's been busy explaining that shift to potential investors, a source tells us he's spending an equal amount of time explaining the upside to advertisers. What he's done to build that platform into the machine that it is, is literally incredible. And so I think they have to look at what's happened in the past as a way to see what's going to happen into the future. John, Mark Zuckerberg has handled a lot of questions about the mobile in issue in particular on the road show. Where does that, for example, fit on his priority list since his priorities are so important? Yeah, well, look, I, I think the one thing we can argue is he is obsessive when it comes to perfecting the product. And that creates this new great challenge for him in perfecting the product for your phone and hope that eventually advertisers will be on board in a big way. Emily? All right. Thanks so much, John Ehrlichman. Now, Facebook's public offering will turn many young Facebook employees into newly minted millionaires and billionaires overnight. So what will these young professionals do with all that money? And what are the risks associated with their wealth? Well, here to help us answer these questions is Michael Cole, president at Ascent Private Capital Management, which is part of U.S. Bank. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Obviously, this is a question that fascinates so many people. Uh, how many millionaires would you estimate there will be after presumably next Friday, when face this coming Friday, when Facebook IPOs? Yep. Well, um, so first off, I should probably wish uh, Mark Zuckerberg happy birthday today because today is his birthday. He is. And he's one of those uh, soon to be minted billionaires. And he also matches the age of many of the other employees. The medium age at, at Facebook is around 26. And uh, out of the 3,200 estimated employees in 2012, about 1,000 of them will become millionaires on Friday. 1,000? Newly minted millionaires on Friday, average age 26 years old. These guys are quite young. I mean, they are. How are they going to handle this kind of infusion of cash? Well, you know, uh, hopefully they'll they'll make good, smart decisions. You know, one of the things is is that they're young, and uh, certainly they're going to want to go out and uh, take advantage of their newly minted millions, and they will uh, certainly be a boom to the real estate market and the, to the uh, to the car market down here. But also, um, hopefully, they'll be smart around making sure they think about the fact that, you know, this is a, uh, not something that happens every day. 
and you can't plan on it being uh, something that you'll do time and time again, although at 26 you kind of think that the world is your oyster and that uh, the possibilities of doing this again and again are, are easy to make. So they're going to be buying houses, cars, come on, are, aren't some of them going to buy some new fancy toys or something? Ferraris and... Something that's totally impractical. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And at 26, I'm sure that uh, some of them will do that, but also hopefully they'll make some smart decisions. One of the things they need to think about is, is not over leveraging themselves and, and thinking about the level of concentration that they have. You know, they are employed by Facebook, which is their source of income. Also, their source of wealth is Facebook. So, you know, they just need to be thoughtful around, you know, protecting against the downside risk. It's a, an amazing company with uh, amazing potential. Uh, 900 users of Facebook today, estimated to 2 or 3 billion before too long. But when you look at it on a, a sheer valuation basis, you know, you have to be smart about making sure that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So how much do you recommend they sell out of the gate and how much should they hold on to when you're advising these kinds of clients? So when you think about it, as I said, you know, their employment and their net worth is tied into the one company and it is a technology company and I think that, you know, as practical they should be starting to liquidate and diversify. They're going to have large positions in Facebook. It will be their primary source of wealth and employment. And so, therefore, the more they can diversify out and buy things that are sort of non-correlated to technology, non-correlated to the social networking game, the better off they are. You know, there are, there are two sides to the way the story can go. You can have uh, what happened with LinkedIn, which has done fine and done well, or you can look at other stocks that haven't done quite as well, like Pandora. And so you want to be smart about the fact that, you know, you want to be diversified and uh, you're going to have tremendous wealth if the company continues to grow, but you also want to take advantage of the fact that you've had this amazing windfall from the great hard work you've done even at 26. What about Uncle Sam? One of the Facebook co-founders, Eduardo ha Saverin, recently renounced U.S. citizenship. He said it's because U.S. laws make it difficult for him to invest abroad. He lives in Singapore. Sure. It seems awfully coincidental since it also helps avoid U.S. tax laws when he gets a big infusion this Friday as well. For the people who aren't moving, what kind of taxes are they facing? Well, you know, it depends on the nature of the stock and, you know, some of them will face ordinary income, some of them will face capital gains tax or a combination of both. But, you know, we believe in not letting the, the, the tax tail wag the dog, so to speak. You know, good planning is involved. Taxes are one consideration you want to make, but you also want to look at lots of other consideration. Concentration risk, income needs, long-term goals are all things we want to take into consideration. So taxes are important, but they're not the, the only or primary consideration. Is this sort of cash infusion for Silicon Valley unprecedented, or is it very much like what we saw with Google, what we saw with Apple, you know, many years before that? Well, we are in the center of, you know, innovation and, and, and one of the, the core areas of the world in wealth creation. And certainly Google and Apple and other companies like that have created great levels of wealth. The thing that we look at is there was also those companies back in 98 and 99 that created a lot of paper wealth, but by 2000 that paper wealth had disappeared. So, you know, it's, it's uh, certainly not unprecedented, but it's something that you have to be really thoughtful around. And nothing is guaranteed. All right. Michael Cole, U.S. Bank Wealth Management President, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much. On Bloomberg West. If only we'd all gone into Facebook that early. Now, before co-founding LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman had plenty of experience developing products and companies. So how does he put that experience to work when it's time to decide which new startups to back? That coming up. Welcome back. I'm Emily Chang. We turn now to our Planet Forward series, part of our partnership with Planet Forward, a program that brings experts and leaders together to create innovative projects in the areas of energy and sustainability. Today's energy innovator is the Palo Alto Research Center, which is tackling one of the great challenges of our time, water. What if we could find a better way to clean it that was easier and required less energy? Planet Forward's Frank Cessna tells us the key is to take the filter 
out. A booming population needs more and more water, but a changing planet threatens that water supply, from farming and development to energy production and our own garbage. It's a growing challenge to keep our water clean. Engineers at Palo Alto Research Center say they have an idea whose time has come. So they made a video and uploaded it to Planet Forward to explain. It's a way to separate particles in a liquid without having to go through a barrier or membrane. To tackle a global problem, they offer this plastic ring. Here's a case where you can actually move particles just by running them through a simple liquid channel. What makes it different? Instead of trying to catch pollutants in a filter, the impure water works its way through the spirals, shedding the bad stuff along the way. It works a bit like a centrifuge, one of those machines that spins material to separate impurities. Except... What we're doing here is much more gentle, and it's actually um, what we're inducing is a vortex which sweeps all particles to the outside wall where they can be separated away. There are some limits here because the system works by teasing pollutants away from water. Some sticky substances make it through. And it still works on a very small scale, although the Palo Alto team says the devices can be stacked to increase the volume of water cleaned. But with no moving parts, this design could be incredibly efficient. They're not putting any filters or any kind of interferences which slows the water down, which means you need more power to move that water through, more pressure to move that water through. So therefore, they can move, they can treat more water using less energy. Using less energy, cleaning more water, hoping to move the planet forward. And we are joined now by Frank Sesno, director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. Frank, welcome back. So let's talk about this new type of filtration system. Has this actually been field tested in any situations, disaster situations in particular? It's, yeah, there's a, it's going to be a prototype facility at a wastewater treatment plant in the Bay Area, right, right near where you are. What's really Quick amazing about this, yeah, well, you know, you want to drink better water, right? So <laughs> it can take out oil, algae, gas, even anthrax, God forbid. Uh, it can, they say, can consume up to or clean up up to 25 million gallons of water a day. Here's the really nifty part. There's some of the things that they can take out, some of the impurities they can take out of the water that they could then turn and turn into methane, which then turns into electricity. So now you're not, not only are you cleaning up the water, but you're generating power at the same time. A uh, bottom line to this, you know, think about a wastewater plant, all that nasty stuff that's being purified before it goes back out for you to drink. When there's a big storm surge, that stuff can flood. It can do all kinds of other things. So this is the idea. The idea behind this is to clean it up, clean it up really efficiently, and clean it up uh, using virtually no energy in the process. Okay, Planet Forward's Frank Sesno. Thanks so much for that report. And if you have an idea you'd like to submit to Planet Forward, visit planetforward.org. Org. For more environmental and sustainability news, make sure to check out Bloomberg.com slash sustainability. Silicon Valley is booming with hot tech companies right now, but what about the search for top talent? How do you find the next Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, or even Steve Jobs? We've got that answer next. This is Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. He's the co-founder of LinkedIn and one of the most successful investors in Silicon Valley. We're talking, of course, about Reid Hoffman. Tomorrow, he will be the subject of a special Bloomberg Game Changers. It's usually within five minutes that I can tell if I want to make an investment, and usually because it's the way they're thinking about it. Because by having had so much experience launching consumer and businesses myself, that you can say, oh, that's not going to work. Like what you're what you're talking about, that's simply not going to work, <laughs> right? Or has a very low likelihood of working. Watch Bloomberg Game Changers. Reed Hoffman. The show airs tomorrow night at 9 Eastern and Pacific, only on Bloomberg Television. Now, Facebook's IPO will stuff the company's coffers with cash. All the more reason to expect talent wars to heat up in the coming months. For more on how some of Silicon Valley's smaller players compete against the likes of Facebook, let's check back in with our John Ehrlichman. John? Well, Emily, there are a few ways you can do it. You can offer more cash in the competition. Or how about this? You hire a dude with a swirl of a sign. Yeah, that's Silicon Valley. This guy was uh, hired by cloud storage player Ignite. Vineet Jain is the company 
co-founder and CEO, and you, you, you placed him effectively near one of your competitors. So what, you ju just get a swirling sign and, 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 and your problems are solved these days? Well, actually, it's, gotten, it's been so crazy that you got to do pretty much everything out of the box. So the salary numbers, of course, are the highest it's ever been. I think we are beyond the bubble. We are in the froth territory. But other than doing crazy things like offering BMWs to your hires, which I refuse to do, okay. <laughs> you've got to do something on the cheap. So we actually, for example, had one of these guys who stands at the corner of a company in Pruneyard, who I shall not name. And within like two hours of this guy standing there, one of the VP calls uh, our uh, sales line to say, yeah. what the hell are you guys doing? But hey, it's getting attention. You, you got to do what you got to do. So give us the context. I mean, you're a small company, but you're growing quickly. So how many people are working for you right now? So right now, we've grown to almost 100 people. Okay. But engineering is still a never-ending task in terms of the people you want. And skill sets are in such high demand that despite all the talk about offshoring, the best people you can find is in the valley. And what about the kinds of salaries that these young engineers are commanding right now? I mean, whether it's your company or others, what are the kinds of price tags attached to people who are getting jobs for the first time? So interestingly, to give you sort of an answer to your question, people you would have offered, let's say something like 110K or so, two years back for the same experience, number of years in the industry and all that, today you have to offer almost like 140. 140 today, 110. Almost. Yeah, Two and that's ago. like a median number. For the real kick-ass smart guys, this number doesn't even bring it close. Well, what, what about the Facebook effect? I mean, we're talking a lot about Facebook this week because the IPO, but certainly Google and Twitter and everybody wants to stay competitive. And you're not even competing with those companies. It's just that everybody's competing for the same pool. Is there one company in particular that is the reason for the, the, the higher salaries, or is it just the whole thing? No, it's the group effect. It's like you're competing with the companies you named, you're competing with startups like ourselves, and it's almost the same skill set. And so, A, salary-wise, you cannot be any less than what Google pays, for example, or a VMware pays, but at the same time, you have to make it interesting for them with equity on top of the core compensation. So you mentioned the word frothy. Do you think some of the salaries that are being paid are not sustainable then? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, for... A guy who's coming in with six years of experience or eight years of experience, if you end up forking out north of 200,000 with a 22% overhead, it's hard to sustain that. But how are we going to know when it's no longer sustainable? Is it when some of these companies that are young startups are paying so much and they, they can't sustain their own business? I wish I could answer that. I have no idea. <laughs> I was hoping that this froth will only last for so long. But it seems to be having no sign of abatement right now. It just seems to be going on and on. Hurts the profit margins. Vineet, thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Vineet Jane of Ignite. I should have been a computer science major. Emily, back to you. Oh, we all, we all should have been a computer <laughs> science major. Up next, stick around for our B West fight. One number that reveals a whole lot. It's time for the B West Bite, where we focus on one number that tells a whole lot. Corey, what do you got for us? 28. Today? That's uh, Mark Zuckerberg's age today. Oh, and he's accomplished so much. Happy little. birthday. <laughs> I know, it really do. You got to get off the couch now. You're, not gonna be, you know, you're almost 30. That's going to do something with your life. You know, but what's interesting is he's actually older than Steve Jobs was when Apple went public. There what a go. slouch. There you go. <laughs> I, I, you know, I like baseball. It's Reggie Jackson's birthday, too. Mr. October had, had almost 200 homers by the time he was 28, and he went on to 560. So we can track his home run performance versus point, Zuckerberg's career, stock performance over the next. Right, they were right we'll across the bay. Right. Yeah, oh, true. We'll see if Facebook IPO could be a home run too. Oh come on! <laughs> I like it. No, I like I'm trying it. to make a segue. I don't. I don't know anything about. We'll see baseball. if Zuck can hit three home runs in the same game in the World Series. Then we're talking. There you go. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Who would you rather be? Mark Zuckerberg or Reggie Jackson. We're going to be exploring, by the way, a lot more of the Facebook stuff tomorrow, especially uh, over the next couple of days. And we've got right. a special Intel show we should probably tell yes, people about. Yes, definitely. To that. Tomorrow we have our special. We'll be live Intel from the inside at the Intel Museum. We've got a great guest list for you, including exclusive interviews with Intel CEO Paul Odolini, COO Brian Krasanich, and mobile head Mike Bell will also look at the past, present, and future of Intel and get a look behind the scenes at how the company puts the Intel into your gadgets on a special edition of Bloomberg West tomorrow. Intel from the inside, regular time, 
Don't miss it. It'll be great.